Today is a very important day in the life of the church, the life of every believer, as we celebrate the fact of Jesus rising from the dead. So as we come to this central picture, we need to understand not only does this picture become the foundation of our faith, certainly Paul says And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We also realize that not only is it the foundation of our faith, it's the means by which we hold on to our hope. Peter said it this way, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So during this day, we celebrate not only the event that has a foundation for our hope, but the means by which we, the foundation for our faith and the means which we hold on to our hope, we want to be able to grasp those things. And now this Sunday, I'm starting a new series simply titled Tough Topics. And starting today, we're going to be dealing with some of the tough topics. And if you go to our Facebook page on uh, Church on the Shore, if you go to an Ancock Baptist Church, uh, you can comment on a, a picture that you'll see about some of the tough topics that you'd like for us to talk about. And I'm still open to some ideas that you would think of that would be tough topics. But we're starting with the tough topic of doubt Because it's one thing I believe churches don't talk enough about. As much as we have doubts, and doubts, having doubts is a very common thing, we don't like talking about them. And in fact, if someone does talk about their doubts, many people might treat them like they have a contagious disease. But the reality is, doubts are a common occurrence. And we can overcome them. Now, it's very important to us as we celebrate the resurrection to come to grips with our faith and to overcome our doubts. Certainly all the way back to the first Easter, there was an expression of doubt that was overcome by the resurrection. Take a look at this. My name is Thomas, and I struggle with doubt. I followed Jesus for years. From the very first day he called me, I saw things so amazing they defied explanation. I believed. But then things fell apart. I witnessed the betrayal that led to the cruel march to Calvary and his agonizing crucifixion. I survived, but everyone I knew scattered. My world collapsed. Then came news of the empty tomb, the very first Easter. But I resisted. The image of his broken, lifeless body was still burned into my memory. I experienced his death that I couldn't believe. Not until I see the scars with my own eyes and touch them with my own hands, I told the others. I wasn't ready to put my trust in something again. But Jesus came to me. He knew my doubts. He even named them. But he wasn't angry. He didn't rebuke me or dismiss me. He looked at me with those familiar eyes offered me his scarred hands inside. In that moment, I experienced his resurrection, and I believed. He met my doubts with grace and love, and he only asked one thing of me. Believe. It is my prayer that whatever doubt you may have, that we would be able to come to a point where we would be believe in Christ. Uh, we're going to be looking at this narrative of Thomas 
who was uncertain about certain facts. And because of his uncertainty, it led ultimately to him having difficulty even trusting in God. So if you have a copy of God's word nearby, we're going to be in John chapter 20. The fourth gospel, the gospel of John, records the events of Thomas's life. And in this specifically, how Thomas, after the crucifixion, had a lot of difficulty trusting in the disciples who had also seen the resurrection. So let's take a look. We're going to be in John chapter 20. And as you are able, would you stand with me as a demonstration of respect for God's holy written inerrant word? Starting in verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him and said, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who who have not seen and yet have believed. Would you pray with me? Father, we do, unfortunately, from time to time, have doubts. And because of these doubts, it keeps us from fully following you. So, Father, I just pray that you'd help us to learn how to deal with doubt. And through this, that you'd be lifted up and glorified, because we ask it in Christ's name. God's people said, Thank you. Maybe seated. One of the things that is often misunderstood about doubt, people sometimes think of doubt as a sin or even the unpardonable sin as much as how people treat each other who have doubt. But the reality is God can use doubt for good. And in fact, as we see Jesus responding to Thomas, not only did Jesus respond to Thomas giving him exactly what he needed in order to believe, but because of Thomas' doubt, he was able to glorify Christ through his expression of praise and worship after he had overcome his doubt. So all, all the, it's obvious that although we do not fully want to be doubting, Even doubt can be turned to good. But the second thing that was impressive to me is that Jesus was willing simply to meet Thomas where he was. You might think that Thomas, when he had doubts, that Jesus would have just said, Hey, Thomas, you're done, bud. that That was your chance. But he came to Thomas not only with a second chance, but an opportunity to begin again. This is the main point I want you to get. If you have a bulletin nearby, cross the top of the page is what I wrote down as a main point. Jesus will help me overcome any doubts. In the same way that Jesus met Thomas where he was with what he needed, I believe that today Jesus will meet you where you are with exactly what you need. And again, Just because you may have doubts should not be a reason for embarrassment or shame. Uh, Ultimately, doubts can lead to something good. Now again, although doubt can lead to something good, it does not mean that we should all just be excited about doubt. Don't get me wrong. In fact, as a father, I see this with my own children. Uh, I want my children to be certain in what I say. And that's what doubt is, is uncertainty. Some people think of doubt being the opposite of faith. 
But doubt and faith are not opposites. Faith and unbelief are opposites. Doubt is somewhere in the middle. It, it is not full belief, but it is not disbelief. And it's the very presence of doubt that means that faith is also present. I mean, there are people who are certain that there is no God. Now, we know that they're certainly wrong, but there are those people that are unbelievers. By that, they don't have any doubt. So for us to understand doubt is to understand that it's a, a willingness to get past uncertainty. And back to my children as a father, I know that some of the reasons why my kids are uncertain at times is because when I kid with them, they have a difficulty in telling whether I'm being serious or whether I'm just kidding. I'll give you an example. When my wife was unpacking a box after we moved here, and it had some of her old stuff in it. And one thing she pulled out was a photo of her graduating class from nursing school. So in this photograph, you had all these nurses just graduating nursing school. All of them had their bright white uniforms, big smile, because, you know, obviously they'd just gotten out of nursing school. Pretty good achievement. So my daughter, who was watching my wife unpack this box, said, Mommy, what is that? So I jumped in. I said, well, that's a picture of all the people Daddy interviewed to be your mommy. <laughs> then my oldest says, well, why are there three boys in the picture? <laughs> and in that jest, uh, again, I, I gave my children some reason for uncertainty. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong, obviously, with kidding, but God doesn't kid around. Now, I certainly believe that God has a sense of humor. If you've ever seen a duck-billed platypus, you would say that God has a little bit of a sense of humor, but he does not kid around, especially when it comes to matters of faith. So as we come to God, God wants us to be certain. He, he desires us to have certain faith, and because of that, he will help us overcome our uncertainties. In the same way, Jesus helped Thomas. Now, what we will learn today is how that we deal with our doubt and how that we can overcome uncertainty. I've got two points and a few sub points, but I wrote it down this way. Point number one, Jesus wants me to determine if I have a fragile faith. First step is a diagnosis, if you will. Jesus wants me to first determine if I have a fragile faith. By fragile faith, I mean not a strong faith that is certain, and I certainly don't mean unbelief, but I mean a faith that has a lot of uncertainty, or maybe even just a little bit of uncertainty. And that faith is somewhat fragile. So in describing a fragile faith, we need to know whether or not our faith is fragile. Why? If we don't know that we have a problem with uncertainty in our faith, how likely are we going to try and overcome our uncertainty? It's by the very diagnosis of a problem by which that we begin seeking an answer. And so that's what we have to understand. We need to know if we have a fragile faith. Now, one thing that you may not know is that having a fragile faith can be from a variety of reasons. And in fact, doubt has several different types to it. In fact, I believe there are three different types of doubt. First one that I wrote down is it can be factual doubt. It can be factual doubt. This is the most common type of doubt that we come into terms with. Someone just simply has a problem or uncertainty about certain facts. 
Uh, they, they're just having a difficulty with maybe some of the miracles they see in Scripture. Or maybe the, the idea of even the resurrection causes them to have some uncertainty. And uncertainty about facts, that's usually something that's dealt with in the mind. But it is a problem if you have uncertainty, even if it's just factual uncertainty. Let me give you a demonstration Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 12, Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead do not raise, are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, if in Christ we have hope in this life only. We are all people most to be pitied. You see how this logical argument came about because of a factual doubt. The factual doubt in the Corinthian church was there is no resurrection. There is no life after death. And Paul said if you have that uncertainty, ultimately that impacts the other things of the faith, including the central item of our faith, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So understanding doubt is to first understand that doubt begins in our mind in most cases. It's doubting certain facts. But what happens if we do not deal with the doubt in our mind, it ultimately sinks into our heart and becomes what we call emotional doubt. You can write that down for letter B. It can be emotional doubt. Most often times, people that have emotional doubt, they end up representing themselves as having factual doubt. In fact, they may not even know that they have emotional doubt. It, you will see and you'll talk with them and it will seem like that they're having uncertainty about certain facts. But as much as you try to present evidence for those facts, they still answer with, well, what if? What if this? What if this? Or maybe they would be describing it to you as, well, I just don't feel like I'm saved, or I just don't feel like God loves me. Again, pointing to feelings. And it's an emotional experience. Now, oftentimes, emotional doubt comes from factual doubt. If you remember Peter, when uh, Peter was in the boat and Jesus came walking on the sea, you remember that? And uh, Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out there. And he said, okay, come on out. So Peter began walking on the water. But then what happened? The Bible says he saw the waves and he became afraid. That because he saw the fact of the waves pounding against him, he began to have an emotional response and began to be uncertain emotionally. And with that, he began to sink. Now, ultimately, it is true that many times emotional doubt stems from factual doubt, but it's not always the case. There are some people who are certain about facts. They have no doubt about facts, per se, but they still have doubt about emotions, where does that type of emotional doubt come from? If it's not from factual uncertainty, what causes that? Well, usually it's because of disappointment. It's a little bit like this. I remember the Smith family uh, went to the dentist and Joseph Smith was speaking to the dentist and he said, now I want to be clear with something, doc. I don't want any fancy frills. I don't want to pay a lot of money for this. I just want you to pull this tooth. I'm talking about no needles, 
No gas, nothing. Just get right down to it and pull the tooth. The dentist said, wow, I wish more of my patients had such fortitude and willingness. Which tooth is it? To which Joseph looked at his wife and said, show him your tooth, honey. <laughs> now, in that experience, uh, certainly there might have been a little disappointment. But how often are we disappointed with God? Do you think Thomas had factual doubt or emotional doubt? Because he seemed to be focusing on the facts. I will not believe unless I see the fact of his hand being scarred. I will not believe unless I see the fact of his hand. But yet when Jesus appeared, he wasn't so busy inspecting his hand or inspecting his side. Even though that's what Jesus offered him, he fell down in worship. Because I would venture to say that Thomas was struggling with emotional doubt. He felt like he was abandoned. He felt like a loved one had been taken from him. And he was disappointed. So in the same way, we have to be able to diagnose if we have emotional doubt. If, if we are hurting because of some type of disappointment. Now there's a third type of doubt. Again, it begins with uncertainty about facts, then it moves to uncertainty of the heart, and then lastly, it's uncertainty of the will, what we would call volitional doubt. Volitional doubt is any time I doubt whether or not I have fully surrendered my life to God, have I really made that decision? Even further, it might be something about a desire to Keep sin instead of following the Savior. Volitional doubt may be someone who says, yes, I am certain about the facts. Yes, I am certain with my heart. But in all reality, the choices I make don't demonstrate a person who is following Christ. Everybody understand what I'm saying? One of the people who demonstrated volitional doubt was Peter. Take a look at this. They say a rooster crowing is God's wake-up call. Yeah, that's, uh, at least that's the way it was for me. Everything, that, that whole night was a blur, all right? Um, I didn't comprehend, none of us could comprehend everything that was going on, all right? We were all in the upper room, Jesus was washing our feet, um, then we were in the garden, Jesus goes off to pray by himself. I fell asleep, I'm not proud of it, I had a big meal, bread makes me sleepy. And, and then before we know it, Judas is kissing Jesus on the cheek, I try to go help him, I cut off this guard's ear. For the record, I wasn't aiming for his ear. I'm a fisherman, not a swordsman. And then they, uh, they arrest Jesus and they take him off. And we, we ran. I caught a glimpse of Jesus as they were taking him to the high priest's house. I stood at the gate. And some girl comes up to me, starts pointing at me. Starts going, you, you're with him. You're with this man that claims to be the son of God. You're one of his disciples. I felt like every eye was on me. So I just brushed her off. I said, you don't know what you're talking about. You got the wrong guy. I get my way into the courtyard, and uh, it's cold. I, I try to warm up by the fire. And then there's this guy that recognizes me, and he is uh, from the ear incident, you know, and starts going, get him, get him, he's with him, just arrest him, get him. And I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about, all right? I wasn't with him. It was easier the second time to deny him. It was some time right before morning, and, um, wise guy. He 
comes up to me and goes, who are you kidding, all right? Who are you fooling? You're with him. I can tell by your accent. I'm like, this is just the way I talk, all right? And, and the whole night, they kept pushing him around. They kept beating him. They kept spitting on him, throwing insults at him. And I couldn't take it anymore. I had enough. I was tired of people accusing me, looking at me. And I, and I just I said a few things that I'm not proud of. And I was like, leave him alone. You don't know what you're doing, all right? Just leave him alone. I wasn't with him. What we realize from even Peter's experience is that although it begins with a factual uncertainty and may lead to an emotional uncertainty, ultimately it will be demonstrated by a volitional uncertainty. We just won't act like believers. Sure, we may come to church on Easter Sunday, we may Come and be excited and, and praise the Lord, but what will we act like on Monday morning? Will we be like Christ? So ultimately, just in the same way as it impacted Peter and Thomas, we learn a couple things. We learn that doubt, first of all, is fairly common. Out of the 12 disciples, two of them had pretty serious issues with doubt. The second thing that we learn is that doubt, although it is a problem, is something that God is willing to help with. Just as much as Jesus came to Thomas, Jesus also came to Peter. You remember, he appeared to Peter while he was out fishing. Obviously, Peter felt like, well, I've already denied Christ. I'm just going to give up and I'm going to go back to fishing. But Jesus met him there, and there he restored his faith. So the thing that I want you to understand is not only it begins by determining if I have a fragile faith and what type of doubt that may be affecting my faith, but the second thing I wrote down is this. Jesus will help me to grow Jesus will help me grow to have a formidable faith. Jesus will help me grow to have a formidable faith, a powerful faith, a strong faith, an impressive faith. Jesus wants that. Do you realize that, that God wants you to believe? And as much as he wants you to believe, he's not just there to beat you down because of your unbelief or because of your uncertainty. He wants to meet you where you are in order to build up your faith to where you have that strong, vibrant faith. Now, ultimately, how we approach that particular problem is going to be dependent upon which type of doubt we're struggling with. For instance, if you are struggling with factual doubt, what would be the appropriate response? In order to deal with factual doubt, you would normally help someone with the facts. If it's facts that they're uncertain about, then you give them certainty about the facts. And in this case, when we celebrate the resurrection, that is the central issue by which we have certainty. I wrote it down this way as letter A. There is proof in the resurrection. There is proof in the resurrection. We do not have a blind faith. We are not asked to just follow Christ without any evidence whatsoever. In fact, we have a rational faith, a logical faith. And Jesus even proved who he is by his resurrection. That's not the only sign. In fact, as you go through the Gospel of John, as you'd be studying it, he turned water into wine first. He healed on the Sabbath. He healed the sick. He walked on water. He raised the dead. He fed the multitudes. He made the blind to see. And he raised from the dead. Significant points to Jesus being exactly who he said he is. And so when we're dealing with factual uncertainty, we want to make ourselves more aware of the facts. 
It's not like we just have to turn a blind eye to all these facts that are opposing our faith. It's not even the fact that faith and reason are two separate fears. I like how Augustine said it. It's surely by the limitation of our ability to reason that faith is necessary. If we ultimately could totally comprehend God and all of his glory, we wouldn't need faith. But because I can't understand him for all he is, there's certain parts I have to just take by faith. So when we're dealing with factual doubt, we want to go to proof. And the proof that I think is the most dynamic is certainly the proof that is in the resurrection What about emotional doubt? What about when someone doesn't feel like God loves them or doesn't feel like that there's a a way out of the problem that they're facing? They're just disappointed with God. What do we do there? I wrote it down this way. There is a prayer for reassurance. There is a prayer for... For reassurance. I remember in Mark chapter 9, there was a boy, demon possessed. The disciples could not heal him. Jesus came and cast the demon out of the boy, and the disciples later said, Why couldn't we do just that? And, you know, back to the father, when he was healing the boy, he looked to the father and he said, Do you believe? What did the father say? Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. In other words, he came to Jesus and he admitted that he had some uncertainties. And admitting his uncertainties, he may have had a lot of disappointment. The fact that his son was demon-possessed to begin with, he's like, I don't know why God allowed this to happen. He was disappointed possibly. And it, but yet he came to God honestly, and said, you know what, I do have some uncertainties, Jesus. Help me truly believe. Now let me ask you, do you really think if you have any uncertainties in your life, whether they're factual or whether they're emotional, that God is not aware of them? But yet we don't want to come to God and say, God, you know what? I'm really struggling. I've got some doubts here. We don't want to do that because we we think that somehow we're going to be chastised. And, you know, in all reality, if we come to God and just say, you know, I'm struggling. I have some uncertainty. It's even I'm even disappointed. I may even be angry. But just be open and honest with God. And the Bible even concurs with the uh, the, the father that said, I believe, help my unbelief. In Philippians chapter 4, you know, remember Paul was talking about being anxious. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your minds and hearts in Christ Jesus. The idea being, yes, if I've got some doubts, emotional uncertainty, I just need to come to God in prayer. But not only prayer, but prayer with thanksgiving. So it's not only just a spiritual solution, it's also a psychological solution. In other words, instead of focusing on the burdens in my life, will naturally will cause me to feel bad but rather focusing on the blessings in my life, which will cause me to feel good. So instead of all the time focusing on God, I have this burden, I have this burden, I have this burden, rather pray with thanksgiving and say, I have this blessing, I have this blessing, and that will change how we feel. Because ultimately, how we think will change how we feel. Now, it may be that we're not struggling with factual uncertainty, but certainly we can be comforted from emotional uncertainty through prayer. I remember a a mother was sick, not able to go to church, and so the father took their children to church, and the mother, when 
the children got home, asked the oldest boy, Bobby, what did the pastor preach on today? The boy said, well, he kept saying it. He, he said, do not be afraid. Your quilt is coming. What? Do not be afraid. Your quilt is coming. The mother just thought and the whole week she was just, she couldn't understand. So the next Sunday when she was well, she came to church and said, Pastor, what did you preach on last week? He said, oh, the title was, Do Not Be Afraid, The Comforter is Coming. <laughs> yeah. And as much as the Comforter, the Holy Spirit of God, will wrap us in peace, will guard your minds and hearts with a peace that goes beyond understanding, so it will be as we come to God in honest and open prayer. Now, there's still one type of doubt that we have not dealt with. Factual doubt we deal with through the proof, the proof of the resurrection. And emotional doubt, we have a, a prayer of reassurance. But for volitional doubt, we have a pledge. I wrote down this way for letter C, a pledge of rededication. Now, for some people, it would be better referred to as a, a prayer of receiving Christ, not rededicating to Christ. Because some of you might have never received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. If you have never come to a point where you said, I know the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I want to take that gift. I, I want to be a follower of Christ. If you've never made that pledge, that's a pledge that you want to begin with. Now, ultimately, maybe you have received Christ. Certainly, you may not even have any uncertainty. If you have uncertainty, factually, it's maybe pretty small, but you might even have some emotional uncertainty. But the fact is, you're not living like you should for Christ. How about today you choose to begin again? In following Christ. I know in my life there are times where I get out of the habit of reading God's word. I, I get out of the habit of spending time in prayer. And ultimately what happens? It's not surprising. But volitionally I begin to disobey. I, I begin to get out of the will of God. So I've got to choose to get back to where I should be. I've got to choose to begin again. Take a look at this last video.
as we come into a season with new life, flowers blooming, animals out, there is an opportunity for new life to begin in you. Even if your faith has faded, even though you may be distracted by uncertainties, whether they're emotional, whether they're, uh, they're factual or they're volitional, whatever uncertainties you may have, today you can choose to begin again. And certainly that is my prayer. And I've got two concluding points, and I want to wrap this up. But the main thing that I want you to see is that Jesus, certainly, Jesus will help me overcome any doubts. The one thing that he asks is for us to believe. And God wants us to believe. In fact, the Bible says it is impossible to please God without faith. We must Believe, And so in that, God is very interested in us being believers. So with that being said, there's two reasons why I think it's vital for us to have this thing called faith. I wrote it down this way. First concluding point, my faith can overcome my sin. My faith can overcome sin. My sin. By that I mean certainly if you have never received Christ, if, if you are separated from God because of your sin, the Bible tells us, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God through him. So even though we are separated by our sin, we can choose to receive Christ and we can get past our sin. But even if you are already a follower of Christ, you've already surrendered your life to Christ, you may still be struggling with sin. You may be a person that has what we refer to as volitional doubt. Now you may say, well, pastor, I've never publicly denied Christ. You know, that guy Peter, yeah, sure, he was the chief apostle, but you know what? Uh, he, he did something that was just unthinkable. I would never deny Christ. You might say that. But ultimately, Peter was put in a situation where he was trying to survive. His life was in jeopardy. And I've never been put in a position like that, where my life was in danger based upon my belief. But one thing I do know is my life has either reflected the fact that I am a follower of Christ or it reflects that I'm a hypocrite. This is what the Bible says in Titus. Titus chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, it says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. So if we do not deny him by our mouth, maybe we've never been put in a place where we say, I don't know Jesus, or I'm not a follower of Christ, I'm not a Christian. But if we deny him by our works, volitional doubt, ultimately that's still bad. But by faith, we can overcome our sin. Second thing I wrote down is this. Second concluding point, my faith was designed to grow. The faith that we have from God is designed to grow. The Bible says, for by grace you are saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. That God gives us a gift of faith and that faith is designed to grow. And if we have true, authentic faith, it will grow. Help us to overcome uncertainties. Certainly as we were new believers, or as you are a new believer, you may have doubts that are just all over the place. But as you grow in your faith, you become less uncertain. And that's the truth that we should be growing in our faith. And maybe you haven't been growing in your faith in the last few weeks or maybe even the last few months. But today is a day where life 
begins again. Let's pray about it. Father, we do thank you so much that because of Jesus Christ being raised from the dead, that you demonstrate to us that even though our faith may be a a dead faith or maybe even a faith that's just sick, that, Lord, that you can make us well. And as much as even Thomas was a man that that struggled with doubt. Even Peter was a man that, that struggled with doubt, that Jesus was always willing to meet them where they were. And if we would just do an honest inventory of our own faith, we would be able to come to you. We, we would come to this proof of the resurrection. We could come to this, this prayer for reassurance. And Lord, we can make a pledge of rededication and Lord I'm just praying right now that anyone here within the sound of my voice that this would be a time where we make decisions to begin again with you Father this we ask in Christ's name and God's people said